Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm back to University of Basel to give a talk about scanning microwave microscopy that we've developed uh, in a collaboration with Metas. And um, I represent a company that's called Nanosurf. Maybe uh, some of you know about it. It's um, a FM manufacturer that is based in uh, Listal, not very far from here. Uh, so the company has recently celebrated 25 years. Um, we have a big range of products. And recently we've uh, released this, um, uh, the high-end product that's called Drive FM. And also like the, the number of modes that we uh, recently added to our portfolio is, like, has been growing uh, recent years. And we're only, not only uh, producing like a standard systems, we're also heavily um, uh, engaged in the customizing. So for example, this one, you can see is a very large um, system with a very small IFM on top uh, over there. It is really having difficulty navigating this point. Right? Yeah, now it works. So, yeah, and um, yeah, um, the, the scanning microwave is one of the recent modes that we have uh, developed. Now let's let's dive into the topic. The um, the SMM or scanning microwave has been uh, around for almost fifty years. In the beginning, it was used as a free space uh, optics and uh, you know small numerical apertures to to do the imaging. But as you can see, the resolution was not that great. Um, uh, lately, they people realized that using like near field uh, and the um, FM cantilevers uh, works best, and you can get to to sub micron resolution. And the um, what the scanning microwave technique is measuring is measuring essentially. Um, a reflection of a microwave from a tip uh, tip sample interface, and this reflection has a parameter. It's called S one one parameter. So this is all from this this microwave terminology. Uh, S one one parameter is defined as the ratio of the difference between the two um, the impedances divided by the um, the sum of these impedances. And because it's a it's a complex number, so the the S one one is also a complex number. Now the uh, like you know from the maths, the complex numbers could be represented as um, as a sum of a real and imaginary part, or it could also be represented as an um, absolute uh, and phase value. Now, both of these representations are equally uh, could be convenient for physicists and for the different um, uh, SMM modes, uh, different representations are used uh, conventionally. Now you already can see that uh, um, the real part. Uh, the, sort of could represent could be represented as a resistance and the, the imaginary part could be represented as a, as a capacitance uh, here. So from these two, you could, you could uh, extract um, the, um, the conductivity and the dielectric constant of, of your sample. So because you know physicists are mostly interested in measuring physical quantities, not, not some uh, impedance. So as I said, there are different uh, SMM modes. Um, one of the SMM modes is uh, is very basic uh, reflection measurement. So this this uh, S11 measurement, and in this mode, uh, the signal uh, is you know routed from the source to the sample uh, through the probe and this matching impedance uh, circuit, and then it gets reflected and collected by the receiver. And both uh, the source and the receiver work at the same frequency. Uh, so this this mode works for all materials, uh, dielectric metals, um, yeah, semi metal, semiconductors. So basically, anything could be measured with this um, uh, mode. And then here in this measurement, the imaginary and real part uh, are more convenient for representation because then you can directly uh, relate the real part to the resistance and the imaginary part to the capacitance. Uh, the second mode, which is a bit more complicated uh, or convoluted is called a DSDV measurement, and it's sort of related to DCDV measurement, where you, um, uh, together with RF um, signal, you send uh, a small frequency or low frequency signal to the sample. So in these two signals would mix at the surface of the sample or the, uh, the tip to, to sample contact, but they will only mix if there is some kind of nonlinear interaction in the sample that is uh, taking place, and those, Materials, well, not surprisingly, are semiconductors, most of them. Now, of course, there could be other materials like piezoelectrics, for example, but but this method is really widely used in, in the semiconductor industry to uh, to get contrast to dopant density and the dielectric constants. Um, 
Yeah, so in this uh, DSDV measurement, the phase uh, and uh, absolute uh, value of the S11 parameter is more convenient because the phase could give you indication of the top and type of your carriers. So now, once you do all these measurements, so you, again, as I said, you're interested in some physical quantities, so you have to model your system, and the, the model of the system is quite simple. It's really a capacitor. Uh, we have a tip uh, working as one electrode, a top electrode, and then the, uh, there's a conducting uh, back uh, layer. So this is a second electron. In and between, there is an insulator. So you can do calculations on this um, capacitor, and then you can extract, let's say, the electric constant of this capacitor. Well, looking at this formula, you can already tell that uh, to extract these values, you're going to need to know uh, the diameter of the tip and the thickness of your insulator. So these not often you know you can you can get access to these numbers so it's either you do a cm of your tip right after the measurement and you also have to go some kind of a uh, lithography to know the insulator thickness so this is a little convoluted measurement it's not like a straightforward measurement but nevertheless it works well and you can see that, that the smm um, measurement could give a nice contrast to a really wide range of different uh, dielectric constants so this, this research has been done uh, by many groups and particularly uh, the one at Metas and yeah, some uh, many others researchers. Now, if you study semiconductors, uh, things get a little bit more complicated because now you have to deal with uh, two capacitances in series. One is the, the one that we looked at already, the uh, capacitance of the isolator layer and then the, the depletion capacitance of the semiconductor. So again, you can do some math, and from and from these measurements, you can, in principle, get the uh, the dopant density of silicon or other semiconductor that you have. Uh, <clears throat> but still, you get a need to know the thicknesses of uh, of the isolator and the, the the tip radius. So still, could be like a tedious task, and therefore, in in real life, what you do, you use calibration samples. So you, yeah, I will I will talk a little bit about the calibration in uh, SMM measurements later. But um, I will maybe mention a little bit about the limits of DCDV measurement or DSDV. So it's a gated measurement. So it, it, and it only works in very narrow range, or not very, but you know, relatively narrow range of dopant densities. Uh, practically, it's between 10 to the 15, 10 to the 21 of the electrons per cubic centimeter. Uh, and the reason for this is very simple. If you have a low density, then it's basically an isolator. It's very difficult to, to gate and uh, change the, the capacitance. And if it's a high density of carrier, then it's very close to the metal. So it, again, it's very difficult to gate and uh, change uh, density of the, uh, of the carriers significantly that you could see any noticeable signal. Uh, S11 measurement works in much larger range. But then it does not depend on the gating, right? So you measure everything in S11 measurement. Um, so at Nanosurf, uh, as I said, together with uh, our collaborators with Metas, uh, we developed uh, this uh, SMM electronics for, for the microwave measurement. It's a very flexible system. So on the front end, we have this uh, RF network with uh, high frequency mixers. And on the back end, there is the, uh, the FPGA. Uh, all the signal processing is done digital. Digitally, uh, the advantage of the system that you know, the dig digitization happens very early. So we don't operate with uh, um, the low frequency signals. So all the calculations are done at about uh, one megahertz wave. And this is very far away from one or one hour of noise. Uh, it works at about five, five to six gigahertz. So I actually did the whole electronics could work between one and six gigahertz, but uh, practically because we use some uh, impedance matching, so that limits your your operating frequency. Um, also, one of the other advantages that we have here, if you want to do the DCDV measurement or DSDV measurement, you don't need the separate lock-in because we have a built-in function generator inside and the the sideband detection or the Offset frequency measurement uh, happens on the on the FPGA. Now we also have a very um, flexible Python Python based software, which is we also develop at Nanosurf. And if any one of you working with Python and struggling to build GUIs with Python, you check out our Nanosurf uh, Python package. It's not even if you don't have a Nanosurf instrument, there is uh, plenty of examples on how to build GUIs. And there is a, a particular example that just says a GUI template. 
you can just grab, grab this template and build your own GUIs from, from, from this template. Uh, so yeah, I wanted, one thing that I wanted to show on this uh, slide that, um, so as I said, the operating frequency is not, uh, you know, continuously changing. We work this uh, resonance, which is defined by the, the system geometry and the, the matching network. So at this resonance, you can see the S11 parameter is at the minimum. So this is where the most of your signal enters the sample and, you know, has some interaction with the sample material. So then you, you set this frequency into the into here and then you turn on RF uh, here and then you start scanning. So there's not really so many parameters to adjust. It's really uh, easy to use a uh, system. So now, um, you know, for those who work with microwave, you know, you have to take care, special care about the cables. So you shouldn't have lossy cables, um, coaxial cables all the way as close as possible to the tip. Um, here you can see the, 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 this is the end of the coax cable. And then there's um, a coplanar waveguide PCB that is uh, clamping the, uh, the cantilever chip. And as a cantilever chips, we use uh, these Rocky Mountain tips, which is, um, it's it's not a, how do you say a, a wafer scale fabrication. So each uh, cantilever and the tip uh, fabricated one by one. But still, uh, these are very popular uh, tips and RF measurements. Why? Because they're made of solid metal, so there is no dampening of the RF signal. Uh, they don't wear off that easily. If you have uh, metal coated tips, they they lose coating quite quickly, and they also can be resharpened. So in principle, you can use one tip for months and months until you you know really physically damage it, like by dropping, a, let's say, cantilever holder or something. So these are very cost effective, and they can also be very sharp. So you, see, you can see here in a, a CM image of a tip diameter less than ten nanometers. So for coated tips, this is not the case. Coated tips are more like between twenty and fifty uh, nanometers. So. Now I show the, all this instrumentation. What what could this instrumentation be useful for? Well, one of the things we, um, it's a microwave that doesn't really interact with the surface, but it interacts with the volume below the surface. And the the microwaves penetrate deep in the sample, especially if it's a semiconductor or like an isolator. So isolator doesn't absorb that easily uh, microwaves. So in the sample prep is quite easy, and you can uh, image sub structures sub subsurface. This is an example of a work that has been done. Well, I can't tell you where it has been done, but probably one of the key site labs uh, back in the days, they they could see some uh, contrast even uh, under the uh, 400 nanometers of silicon oxide. So then we did some tests of our system. So this is our test sample that we test the performance of the system. It, these are silicon mesas, uh, silicon oxide mesas on the surface of silicon. Now this whole dark brown um, field here, this is silicon and the, the bright dots, this is the silicon oxide. Of course, this is um, create very large difference in the capacitance. So we very easily see this contrast and you can see the like imaginary part has got a little bit higher contrast than the real part. Now the, I have to say between these two channels, imagine the real part. So because it's a vector, you can rotate it. So you can move signal between the two channels. And in principle for this sample, probably all the signals should be in the, in the imaginary uh, part. And that you can achieve by like either post-processing or even in line by changing the uh, phase offset. Uh, one other samples that we often measure is the uh, um, memory sample, SRAM. This is a very typical sample for all these um, microwave measurements because it, it really shows you what, um, like what information you can get, like here, um, these dark lines, here you could see them, these are the um, the conducting channels in uh, inside of silicon. So in these channels, uh, they're subsurface, so you cannot really see them on, on the topography. So they are, on the left, there is a topography image. So you see the, these channels, they're, they're buried under some uh, silicon oxide. Uh, one other thing that you see here that in principle, everything gives contrast. Like so, some grain, grainy area in this sample. This is the polysilicon. Uh, the difference in height also creates contrast. So, in principle, if you are um, doing some measurements that require calibration, you better polish your sample such that there is no topography, or there is the minimum topography um, on the sample. Um, so, 
this is when we uh, come into the DSDV measurement. So DSDV measurement, because it's a modulated measurement that can only give you signal um, to the uh, to the to, to the doped regions in this range of 10 to the 15 to the 20. So these regions they light up uh, quite strongly in the DSDV measurements. And this is again the reason for the semiconductor industry to use this technique because then they can see where really the the, uh, the conducting channels are. Um, I talked about the representation. So again, here we're back to the amplitude phase representation because the the phase in the DCDV measurement shows you the type of the uh, carriers, and but which one is which you don't know. A priori, you have to assume. But when your phase is flipping, you can tell that you know your, the type of your carriers has uh, has changed. Okay, I'm gonna speed up. Uh, don't seem to have enough time. So I talked about the calibration. So the calibration is is uh, not so trivial, and that's why um, the industry has been developing all different calibration samples. And the, the calibration sample depends on what what type of quantity you want to calibrate. And if you're measuring, if you want to know the doping density in your sample, so of course your calibration sample is the different doping densities. So Infineon makes these um, nice grids of different dopant densities exactly in that range of interest, 10 to the 15, 10 to the 20. And by measuring you know, your microwave response from these uh, samples, then you can transfer the, these uh, measurement to, to the sample of interest that you don't know what the, what the dopant density is. Um, another one uh, calibration sample is the is scanning um, is a purely capacitive samples. So these um, uh, silicon oxide terraces at different heights with a different diameter of golden dots that also give different capacitances. And you know the sample was developed quite a long time ago. So the, the the biggest dots here they have too strong signal actually to be interested. So you're really interested in the smallest dots on the, on the highest terrace, and even this one. Um, gives you a very strong response of, uh, let's say, 150 um, at the farad here. So, okay, I um, will not talk so much about the calibration procedure, but I, what, what I will say is, so the reason why you need a calibration is that your measurement is happening at the, at the receiver port, which is S11M on this slide on the top. But, you know, your physical measurement happens at the tip, which is at the bottom of the slide. This is S11, um, you know, the real. So you have to relate the two and, um, you know, you can... Uh, bring this relation to life by using these error coefficients, this uh, E00, E01, E11. So this is basically a characterization of your transmission line that is existing between your port and your uh, tip sample interface. Now the uh, the algorithm was developed at Metas. Um, so there's a link uh, on the slide, you can look it up. And then we also have um, app notes on our website that really described how this calibration procedure is used and you know some mathematical formalism that uh, associated with that. So essentially, if you follow this, if you know the three points on your sample, you can you can uh, translate your S11 parameter into whatever quantity you you want to calibrate. All right, so we'll um, quickly uh, go to the acknowledgments. So the the two guys uh, behind the technology are here in audience. There's Bruno and Johannes uh, sitting on the back row there. So if you want to talk to them, please do during the coffee break. And um, a little bit to summarize, the SMM is, is a very important electrical mode of the FM. It's becoming more available these days because the, the microwave technology gets cheaper and better understood. Um, SMM measures conductivities and the electric constants in materials. It's difficult to calculate ab initio, but the calibration on three standards works very well. So thank you for your attention.